from my travel log, Beach Bar, Australia. New Zahat is a small seaside town located on the east coast of Australia, just north of Brisbane. I loved it at first sight. Not a bad town. It had some Mediterranean feel to it. My idea was to take a one month rest here in between jobs as an assistant and photographer for a famous reporter without borders. After the filming of the chaotic Jewish withdrawal and their allies leaving Kabul, head over heels and abandoning Afghanistan, I was really ready for a good few weeks of carefree lounging in the sun on a golden beach with swaying palm trees. I looked forward to, for a while, not to have in front of my camera miserable refugee camps and their inhabitants, as well as the well-known reporter, my boss who had to be in the picture more often than the Lord Jesus in depictions of the Last Supper. I had learned to be back for a while in the First World, where I could speak English without the need of a stumbling interpreter. A First World where I expected calls institutionalized violation of human rights not to exist, and where I wouldn't have to film all kinds of inhuman suffering and my ex-boss, the one of, hey, do you have me in the picture? It had not been easy to find a nice beach bar. Actually, it had been quite a job to find something to my taste on the first day. I had been looking for a great site that could be illegible to be lyrically described as a typical South Pacific beach bar. A messy but cozy place where you soon become greatest friends with the boss and the staff. Where, as a token of your popularity, often a loving and appropriate nickname is coined for you. Like that time in Jamaica, it had been Ringo Starr, but not for reasons that I look very similar to the Beatle. It had been because one night I thought the reggae band, whose players I had been buying drinks for, needed help with the drums. There is nothing that makes me physically a look-alike of Ringo, though. Nor did I ever learn to play the drums. In all modesty, uh, I'm more of a Brad Pitt type, if I may say so. Anyway, what I had been looking for was, jeez, uh, how I feel myself at home here, beach bar. A beach bar which could be made into my holiday base and where one eats and drinks every day and where you will make new friends and you can leave your wallet with the barkeeper when you go for a swim. Likewise, in such a bar, you've got your own table up in the front to the left where everyone knows to find you, or always with a full glass. Taking in the blue ocean and beautiful women strolling by. I had heaved a deep sigh. <laughs> when I thought I'd finally found something that looked like it. The ancestors of today's Australians were for the most part poor wretches who, long before the time of reporters without borders and their assistant photographers, had been sentenced to life in exile on the other side of the world and down under from the equator for mostly petty crimes. 
It were mainly the less fortunate, those that had stolen a piece of bread, a goose for Christmas dinner, or had nicked a my nailies knickers of the washing line. Any such crime warranted a free boat trip to that sunny place called Australia. For some reason, people weren't then as keen on a bit of sunshine as we are today. These days, apparently 60% of the population of the British Islands would prefer to live in a sunnier clime if they could. 60% of the population would love to steal some knickers and get free passage to down under. Few criminals in those days mastered an Oxford accent, contrary to these days, and it was therefore that the descendants of those shipped away speak a kind of English to this day that was not that easy for me to understand right away. And I had to very much strain myself to figure out what exactly they all had to say. In this particular joint, the burly young man who acted the part of waiter greeted me with an oh, are you? Oh, very well, yourself, I replied in excellent and universally understandable English. Because it is in my nature to make friends wherever I go, be it at home or abroad, I ask several questions which showed my empathy. Such as, ah, do you speak English? Do you live here? Do you like it here? Similar questions had often been asked of me by tourists on a wild Africa in three days tour while I was sitting on a hotel terrace in Addis Ababa. It seemed to me that this waiter was saying yes to all my friendly questions. I also told him that I liked his beach shack very much and that I would appreciate it if he brought me an ice-cold bottle of Chablis in a bucket with ice. BYO, said the lad. BYO, I thought. Perhaps a word taken from the Aboriginals? And obviously meaning something like, I'll bring it right away. As the Aboriginals have been in Australia for some 40,000 years, their language has got to be very old, and like other old languages, take Latin or Greek, for example, their verbs must have declinations. Okay, BYA, I said, taking the liberty to decline it in the imperative, as if it were a Sanskrit verb, therewith conveying the meaning of, okay, bring it. Having said that, there was a sudden need to clean my ears, because it seemed to me that his reply was, Bring it yourself. Excuse me, I said, say that again. Bring it yourself, he said once more, and this time there could be no mistake of having misheard him. Bring it myself, but you are the one who serves here at the tables, I do not. I let him know in intelligible language how very indignant I was about this type of service. That in this formal penal colony they had very little sympathy for the British royal family 
so be it. But what had happened to the motto, the customer is king? Bring it yourself, sorry, he said now, but with a somewhat nasty smile. Controlling myself to the utmost, I said calmly, but certainly, that is your job. How can I, for heaven's sake, serve myself at this table? Here in Australia, you can bring your own drinks, mate. It gave me a warm feeling to be called mate so soon, but nevertheless, I stuck to my guns and protested. I do not want to bring my own drinks. I'm on holiday. I don't feel at all like playing the itinerant beach event. Well, here it is simply like this. B-Y-O. B-Y-O. Bring your own or nothing. We can dish up something to eat, but here in Australia you either have a beverage sales license or you do not. We do not. And then why do you not get one? I asked, highly irritated and not so sure anymore. I actually wanted to be his mate. Because if we had one, our customers would be pissed off not being allowed to bring along their own drinks. You got it? He explained impatiently and asked, Are you a bum or something? It seemed to me as if he wanted to whack me one. What is a bomb? I wanted to know, suspecting that it was nothing flattering. A bomb is a wanker who whines and winces and is from up above. You don't mean from heaven, do you? Customers from heaven with complaints? Oh, well, that's difficult to believe with this kind of service. You're a bum, not if you come from heaven, but from bloody old England. The coin fell. Up above versus down under. Not being English, I was nevertheless not very pleased with this situation because I had once followed a months-long summer course in English in Bournemouth, England. I felt there was reason that I should be praised for my fancy accent and not be insulted by native speakers. Well, I am not, I let him know, and I can't see what difference it makes to you. Well, none really. But if I were you, I would try to get rid of that boxy posh accent of yours. Anyway, I'll do you a favor. I'll tell you where you can find a bottle store nearby. I would highly appreciate that. I mean, uh, I think that's very kind of you. Okay. Okay, where? That night I wrote in my diary. It would not surprise me if I only stay here two weeks instead of one whole month. After having slept into the late morning hours, the next day I decided to nevertheless make the most of my stay in Down Under. With my energy renewed, I paid a visit to the bottle store, and then, firmly decided, I drove my rental car towards the beach bar that fate had assigned to me. The previous night I had worked out that this bring your own to a bar or restaurant does not have to be such a bad thing. Quick math soon showed that with this system your vacation dollars could last a lot longer, and especially in my case when on holiday in the tropics. 
A substantial portion of these dollars will be spent on the liquid component of my holiday. If I played my cards right, I could do all sorts of fun things with the money saved. Like having a professional photographer do a shoot of me with a koala on my lap. Koalas being native grey marsupials with funny ears. Or have a nice snapshot taken of myself with my own funny ears in the pouch of a huge female kangaroo. I parked my car in the shade of palm trees and unloaded my esky, Australian for cooler, with stocked up drinks to pass the day. It seemed to be low season. Either that or the backpackers had discovered other restaurants where they could not only bring their own drinks but even bring their own food. This was probably the reason why only one table was occupied at the outdoor terrace around noon. The occupation was by a long black-haired young woman who kept her eyes hidden behind dark sunglasses and wore a bikini which hid very little. My experienced eye noted that this was a model with which a photographer might have his hands full. The type which makes you run out of film rolls in no time. I do not stare at others because it is bad manners, but at first glance she promised to be worth a more discreet observation. What's the special today, I asked the waiter when I sat down at a table that proved to be big enough to place my ASCII under, and from where I could stare without the girl noticing. Today's tucker is crocodile with that horse. Very nice. We still have a few servings left over from yesterday. Crocodile and dead horse from yesterday. And this I was told by that same waiter who only yesterday had called me a pom. I had to reflect on this. It can be imagined that in the early years of the colony, two escaped convicts ran off on just one horse and mercilessly beat the beast up to see if there was still enough life in it when it succumbed with its four legs up in the air next to an empty water well in the desert. Surrounded by endless miles of sand and millions of flies, they realized that little food was to be obtained in such scorching desolation and that the choice was to either keep their mouths open and chew flies or with pounds and pounds of horse meat at close hand to create the first national dish named Dead Horse. I was not seated near any empty water well, rather to the contrary. And in the knowledge of a chock-a-block full esky under my table, I did not feel like trying out this national delicacy. Oh no, you don't mean it, I said in a friendly tone, doing my best to hide my unease about how far these Elsies would go to annoy pumps and anyone else with a decent accent in English. Pumps who came from that very country that had colonized the continent of Terra Australis, on their behalf, these current Aussies. A country known as Albion some 20,000 years ago, and that had had, since the arrival of the Anglo-Saxons, 17 centuries of civilization, and hence had had sufficient time to work on an appropriate pronunciation 
of its language. This country was also to export, besides convicts, live horses to Down Under. It was their fate to eventually become dead horses. I saw an opportunity here for a deserved revenge and said, Crocodile and dead horse. Ha ha ha. E I Y. What do you mean? asked the waiter innocently. E I Y E I Y, I laughed. Eat it yourself. <laughs> Don't want it then, noted the waiter surprised. No, not really. I'm not so crazy about crocodile, believe it or not, I replied, making the effort to explain. I then just thought of something with which he could not fool me. That sign outside says, you do English breakfasts all day. Bring me that, please, and a lot of ketchup. Did I imagine it, or did I really hear that bastard shouting to the chef? An English breakfast for that fake pom of yesterday with a load of dead oars over it. I almost fell off my chair in outrage. I was even angrier when Miss Bikini in front of me looked sideways behind her and giggled. Whoa! I started angrily at her. I do not like it when I'm made a fool of. I also see now that she is beautiful indeed, and beautifully endowed by nature. Definitely shooting material. Oh, nothing! She giggles behind her hand like someone trying not to burst out laughing. Come on, tell me, what's so funny? She also had an enchanting giggle. I wished she would take off those sunglasses. Worried about dead holes? Don't be, she said. Now here was a beautiful English accent if there ever was one but also there was this very light accent of somewhere that i could not place but somehow seemed familiar to me well the horses are dead thank god but uh, i'm more concerned about the crocodile I grinned to show that I could look at things from the positive side, but equally also that I was not the kind of person who innocently eats anything and everything. Everyone here eats whatever with dead doors. You name it and dead doors goes over it. Fries, hamburgers, lamb chops, kangaroos, he said in English, and I thought I heard that something of a somehow familiar accent again. I wouldn't mind having you with a slice of horse meat over it, I thought to say. I may be dumb, but I'm not that stupid. There are some things I think, but do not say, and there are many things that I say and that I did not think through well enough. In the latter case, I've noticed that when I carelessly blabber a bit too much, things usually do not turn out well. So there I sat on a beach overlooking the Pacific Ocean at a shared terrace at a practically empty beach bar with an exotic, raven, black-haired young woman, all on her own. I knew she could be called exotic because she had a beautiful tan and this long black hair. Well, whatever. I found her exotic, exciting, and so exciting, 
that I myself got very, very excited. Not wanting to say anything thoughtless, I tried to think deeply of what I could say to make a good impression. Before I had thought of something useful, however, she again produced a melodious giggle. She was apparently having enough fun to, halfway turning around to me, inspect the one who caused all this fun. Reason why she even took her crimson glasses off, and with a twinkle in her dark emerald green eyes, she looked straight into mine. Yes, dark emerald green eyes. She should not have done that. Had I only been excited just then, now I was totally lost. This was the woman of my dreams. I was drowning myself in those eyes of hers, with those eyelashes that went up to her eyebrows. Not because she had very low eyebrows, no. It was because she just had very long eyelashes. And then what happened? Despite my confusion, I followed her movements and saw that she was now with her hand in the bag, rummaged through it and pulled the book out. Oh no, you're surely not going to read a book now, eh? I silently protested internally. Reading a book in a bar or restaurant is the same as a please do not disturb card on the door of a hotel room. Luckily I was able to read the title. My Guide to Australia. Hmm, that should mean that she was a tourist, a foreigner like me. Someone lonely, just like me. Someone who needs companionship from someone with the far-sightedness of having organized a box full of cool beer and Chablis under his table. She flipped through the pages of her book and now completely turned around to me she said, please, come over here, come, and have a look, and pointed something out in her book. Come here, as in, come here, sit next to me and look in my book, please. Did I ever move as fast from one table to another and fall? over my own feet and knocked down three chairs on the way to it and all that in less than half a second. I did it this time and I also managed to say completely out of breath, I'm sorry. In my own polite and extremely well-mannered way, I did not wait for her to ask me to sit down. Being my own clever self, I helped myself to a seat and sat next to her to look into that book and hopefully if I could help it sometime later into her eyes again to look into her book with her I had to lean against her never before did I so enjoy the written words which her very delicate and very exquisite finger was pointing at and which were strine, Australian slang. And the words pointed out to me were dead horse, tomato sauce, ketchup. With my knowledge of the Australian cuisine now sufficiently jacked up, I could at least look forward to not having to eat real horse meat on top of all sorts of goodies even if my efforts to enter into a loving and lasting relationship 
with this dazzling beauty would fail. Ha <laughs> ha, dead horse. Tomato sauce. <laughs> Can you imagine? I laughed just like someone who has just found out that in Australia, dead horse is mere ketchup. Convenient such a book. I should have one. Would make my life a lot easier. Where are you from, if I may ask? I think I am from where you are from. I think I can recognize your accent, she laughed. When she suddenly switched into Brazilian Portuguese. I nearly fell off my chair again. Could that be possible? Oh no, God, what a coincidence. Hey, are you here on holiday or something? Within 15 minutes I learned that her name was Sylvia. A sensei, meaning third generation Japanese in the Americas. Her grandfather had been an Englishman who had married her Japanese grandmother. The Japanese not being very popular in Europe right then, and foreigners not very popular in Japan, they decided to emigrate to Brazil, where in and around Sao Paulo lived the largest Japanese community outside Japan. They had a son, her father, who married an English girl who worked at the British Chamber of Commerce in Sao Paulo. Sylvia grew up trilingual, speaking Japanese, English and Portuguese fluently. She had taken a course in England, teaching English as a second language. She now taught English in Japan. She was unmarried and, like myself, here in Australia for a break. I told her my name and emphasized as much as I could that I was also free as a bird. So free that I was actually immediately available to take English classes to improve my pronunciation. I was a bit fake about my profession. Freelance photojournalist, I said. I'll tell you more about it later. Meanwhile, can I get you something to drink first? I have my own depot there under the table. Beer, a glass of wine? She frowned, as if it were a difficult decision to make. Well, what would you like? I insisted. No, she did not say, I would like to kiss you. Something I felt myself the urge to say. She said, well, if I may, I would prefer a glass of orange juice. That's what I feel like having right now. I beckoned the waiter who was leaning against a coconut tree standing on one leg and scratching a body part which ought not to be scratched in public and much less by waiters in view and on call. Do you do orange juice? I asked the idling waiter. Yes sir we do. Is it called orange juice or does it have a different name? in your local language, such as something that gets spurted at regular intervals from between the hind legs of a horse? <laughs> it's just called orange juice. Excellent. Can you be so kind as to squeeze out a few oranges for this lady here? And I'd like an ice cold glass so I can start taking sips from my foster beer cans which I've got in my ice key there under the table. Can you also tell the kitchen that I'm in no particular hurry and do not mind at all if I have to wait some 45 minutes 
before the bite with the dead horse on top arrives. Okay, Bonza. The waiter replied enthusiastically and walked towards the kitchen. Bonza, Bonza, could this become my nickname in this bar? Sylvia, can you do me a favor and see what that word Bonza means? I don't feel like being called a Bonza all the time. I can feel in my bones that it means something like boozer or drunkard. That boy could make it a habit calling me Bonser, and in no time I will be known by that derogatory name. Bonser, wait, Bonser. Sylvia found it quickly. Oh, that, that's fantastic, excellent. This guy calls me Bonsa, and that's great. Yeah, that's fantastic. Why do you think it is great that this guy calls me a Bonsa? Well, it says so here in the book, Johnny. Why, let me see. This goddess called me Johnny, not John, Johnny. Could I care that the waiter calls me Ponza? Yeah, sure, but not now. I love the look of words together with Sylvia in her book. That way we can have our heads together and our temples touch briefly. There, look, she says. Here it is. Ponza, great, fantastic. It was Ponza to look in her booklet. Again, I was awarded the privilege of having a peek into this fine book of hers. The looking up of the word Ponza made me realize, for the first time in my life, the true meaning of the word bliss. I wished that the booklet were even smaller and that together we could look up more great words and could have our heads glued together a lot longer. I looked for something strine for taking pictures, photographs. I could then, as if it were a sudden idea, take a picture. I could not find anything in her book. So I said, how about cooling off a bit after your orange juice? I'd love to go for a stroll in the surf and shoot you. That night I wrote in my travel journal, all this is getting to be quite bonza here in Down Under. I will certainly stay here for a whole full month. Then I'll go and see what there is to photograph in Japan. It's bound to be a very detailed and lengthy shoot.